we spend so much time twisting ourselves in knots about unimportant things. And we just talked about how hideous, I'll use the word hideous because I literally looked hideous. I mean, I not only had a tomato red face and like crazy witch hair and uh, foggy glasses and bad breath and impacted sinuses and probably throwing in a camel toe in there too. I didn't have anything tied around my waist. Um, but not giving a shit about that is very liberating because otherwise I'd be embarrassed by my own existence walking down the sidewalk. And I would twist myself in knots worrying about what do I look like and how red is my face? Is my face coming down? And maybe I should go back to the hotel and take a shower and get this makeup off my face and blow my nose before I get a cup of coffee. And, and all of that energy twisting myself around what other people may be thinking rather than just being okay, not giving a shit. It's so liberating. And I think about that example of for how long I was willing to twist myself into little spaces that didn't fit and how painful it can be when you hide who you are, when you're embarrassed about what you look like, when you worry about what other people think about what you're wearing. And yet it's also the flip side is when you give a shit about the right things, twisting yourself into spaces like a small tent is an act of joy because it's aligned with what you value. I didn't give a shit how small that little hole was. I had to army crawl my ass in there in order to get in. And then I had to swirl around like a centipede to curl up in there like a little ball because it was so aligned with my value, my values of wanting to serve, of wanting to bring fun, of wanting to demonstrate something which was enthusiasm and surprise and celebration and not giving a shit, like being willing to do that kind of stuff. And so, you know, as we kind of continue to go deeper in all these examples of how I'm oblivious at times and how I've worked actually really hard to get to this point of acceptance and this point of focusing on caring about things that I value and trying to completely disregard aspects of life that I just don't give a shit about that visual of the tent and why it's important to twist yourself when it's about your values versus twisting yourself when it's not that's really helpful to see did I do anything else that day probably <laughs> <laughs> probably is probably the right answer but I don't have any specific me neither I, know if I does. do Botox <laughs> Oh, oh my gosh. <laughs> so I got Botox, everybody, in my jaw joint. And I've been going to the same dermatologist for over a decade. I love her. I trust her. She's sensational. And I've been having tremendous pain in my jaw, grinding, trouble eating. And both my primary and my dermatologist was like, you got to get Botox in your jaw. And when she felt my jaw, she's like, holy shit, that's a tense muscle. You're going to have to have a little extra. And I'm like, okay as long as you make the pain go away. And she said, well, it could impact your smile. I'm like, I don't care. I can't eat at this point. Just take the pain away. Well, she shot me up. And let me tell you something. It impacted my smile. I look like a taking a shit when I, when I have a smile. And I'm so, this is something that I am self-conscious about. So all week long as we're in Los Angeles and we did a bunch of interviews, I'm having to really try to like manage that my lips are curling up because if I do a closed smile, try to lip smile like you keep your mouth smiled, I, I, my lips suck in like our body language expert warned us about. What's that called? A lip? Lip roll. A lip roll. I do a lip roll and it looks like I'm frowning. And then if I try to do a big toothy smile, I look like I'm grinding out of shit. Like I'm like, ah, clenching. And so I had to... Tell every single expert we had. Now, look, I'm going to give a kissy face in this because if I try to give you a smile, I'm going to look like I'm growling at you. And so I now have a week's worth of photos from both graduation week and the podcast where I'm kissing experts and kissing in the air and I look completely ridiculous, but at least I can chew food and the pain has gone away, but I'm never getting Botox in my jaw again. 
But right now, you don't give a shit. I don't. But it, it, it bothers <laughs> me a little. But I'm trying to direct my attention away from how I look and just go, Mel, it looks like shit, but whatever. What was the CNN story? Exactly what you said. Can I read to you what some people said to you on CNN? Wait, you have it? I do. Oh, my God. She went back in time. I think a lot of it you remembered, but this is pretty brutal. I have four outstanding comments. Let's say that. Your neck is saggy, just like your opinions. <laughs> <laughs> it's funny now, but you were probably like gulp when you got that, right? Like that yeah, was probably really hurt in the beginning. Yeah, probably it hurt. Sure did. You should go back to the hole you crawled out of. It was a deep hole. Now we know you're an expert on crawling out of small spaces. Yes. Yep. Why is someone so ugly on television? Ouch. Ouch. Nice. Because I'm smarter than you, fuckface. <laughs> <laughs> okay. <laughs> the last one. Um, how does a moron like you have a law degree? I cheated. That's, <laughs> how, I know, just, <laughs> that's how to not give a shit. Well, yeah. you know how I learned how to not give a shit is I started to visualize. Empathy helps a lot. So a couple things on other people's opinions. Number one, let's just take a minute and zoom out and have some perspective and imagine what is the life of a person who is sitting on their phone, watching TV nonstop, sounding off at pundits online. What does their life actually look like? I would imagine hypertension. I would imagine a lot of negativity. I'm going to throw in a little alcohol or drug abuse. Probably a small circle of friends. Not getting a lot of sex, I would imagine. <laughs> Perhaps living in your parents' basement. I would think your bills are piled sky high if that's how you're spending your time. If you truly spend time sounding off at strangers online, your life sucks. Mm -hmm. And so feeling sorry for somebody that cuts you off in traffic or even like the mean girls. Mean girls are shitty people. You know how insecure they are? If you need a fucking purse and a designer whatever in order to have high self-esteem, you are really fucking insecure. And so I kind of just look at people that are critical of other people, even though I'm being critical of other people, you know, for the sake of humor, I, with a lot of sympathy. Like, wow, must really suck for you to watch TV and feel so offended or triggered by what I'm saying that you are taking time and energy to not only write about it, but to spread negativity. That's a really awful place to live your life. I hope you find a good therapist at some point and you get the healing you deserve. And so kind of understanding the greater context and not making it about you, like, I, I really mean that. Like, I, I think about, like, lots of experiences of just mean clicks of people and how they look down on other people. And I literally say to myself, I would hate to be part of that friend group. And one rule of thumb that I think about a lot is this, like I think small minds talk about other people and really cool, big, creative minds talk about ideas, they talk about things, they talk about the future, and that's what I'm interested in. And so when, when you kind of make it not so personal, that, helps a lot. Mm -hmm. And when you elevate yourself above the kind of pettiness and the criticism and the negativity that other people might throw at you, it helps me rise above it. And the truth is, you know, there are days I look like shit. And there are days that I probably look like I shouldn't be on TV. And you know what? <laughs> I don't give a shit. <laughs> so um, it helps a lot. It helps a lot because it's mentally healthy to be able to detach. And a lot of your mental health struggles, whether it's anxiety or disconnection or paranoia, it's all a result in many, many, many cases of you being way too concerned about shit out of your control and way too focused on stories that you're telling yourself that aren't even true. 
And so if anybody's out there gossiping about me, you need to get better hobbies. You really do. If, um, you know, you're looking down on other people or notice the next time you go into a social setting and notice how much time is spent talking about people who aren't there. Mm. If that's what's happening in your social setting and it's not like a, it's not a structured conversation around you seeking advice about a situation, which is very different than gossiping. You can seek advice about a situation with another person in your personal life, in your family, or in business, and not have it be gossiping. But if you're engaged in constant banter about other people who aren't present, you need bigger goals, you need to do more with your life, and you need to assess like who you're hanging out with. Because when they gossip with you, they're going to gossip about you when you leave. That's what those kind of people do. And so it helps to not gossip yourself because I think gossip is one of those things that you also start giving a shit about things that don't matter. Like, because gossiping is caring about shit that doesn't matter. And I don't think very successful people or accomplished artists or the greatest entrepreneurs are wasting time giving a shit about gossiping about other people. And I used to be a big gossiper. I can say this with certainty because I used to be that insecure, desperate, clingy, anxious, competitive bitch. And I'm not that person anymore. And gossiping is, was a big thing in my uh, 20s. It is not part of my life anymore at all. How do you not give a shit? And these are just four random things that I just tried to distill down because I want to give you a takeaway. This shows you a little behind the scenes. It allows me to show you more of my personality and have a fun way of having you meet Cameron, one of our producers, and Jesse, who runs video uh, and production here for the podcast, and Christine, our COO and CFO, who did not want to be on camera, and I'm proud of just like, fuck it, I don't give a shit. I'm just going to jump on, <laughs> even though this is out of my comfort zone. And Amy, who's you know one of our senior team members and producers here, um, but I'm like, I got to figure out like what, what, what's something you guys can grab onto. Okay. So the first one is rule number one for how to stop giving a shit about things that don't matter. Rule number one, try giving a shit about everything and see how it feels. I, I'm dead serious about this. I know it sounds stupid, but why not worry about what shoes you're wearing? Worry about what everybody's thinking. Worrying, worry about what your boss is doing. Worry about what's going to happen next week. And then stop and ask yourself, is that working for you? Does it really work for you to lie in bed at night and worry about what your friends are doing? Does it really work for you to scroll through social media and worry about the weight you've gained or worried about this? Does it really work for you to obsess about what outfit you're going to put on seven different times before you leave the house? Does it really work for you to worry about the fact that your makeup is drowning and you just drop the mask? Like that's the point of this. Because if worrying about everything and giving a shit about all this stupid stuff actually worked, you'd be happier. You'd feel more secure. You'd have more time because you uh, would work. But it doesn't work. It is so liberating when you realize that, my God, I'm robbing my own energy and my own focus and my own confidence by worrying about so much shit that doesn't matter. Stop it. Stop it. And if you can't stop it, I would just goose it, man. I would step on the accelerator and I would worry about every damn thing and then ask yourself, is this really helping me? Because it doesn't help you to put your hand on a hot stove. That's why you don't do it every day. That's rule number one. Rule number two, this kind of goes back to the stuff we talked about with CNN and kind of zooming out and visualizing who actually is criticizing people online. I mean, come on now. Let's show some empathy. So rule number two for me that has helped me really stop obsessing about what other people are thinking or other people's reactions is I've come to believe that almost everybody you meet is at about the emotional maturity of somewhere between eight and 12. I think that's where most people get stuck. Most people's disappointment is an eight-year-old throwing a tantrum. Most people being mad at you is about as long as an 11-year-old is mad at you. And we conflate adults with adult maturity when it comes to their emotional reactions, and 99% of the population does not have it. And so if you can kind of imagine your boss as an eight-year-old, like I think about the guy that we were meeting with at um, Audible, great guy. I 
freaking love him. I hope we do a ton of business together. But I think about him as like a, like a cool kid, you know, who's playing games and video games and super innovative and super smart. And it allows me to just relate to him on that human level instead of trying to do that gamesmanship and bad boss and I'm going to get the deal done. No. Think about everybody as between the emotional maturity of 8 to 12 and you'll worry a lot less about how they react. Now, rule number three is incredibly important, and I want to thank my team for helping me distill this down because I think this is super, super, super important. Rule number three is when it comes to not giving a shit, there is a time and a place for it, okay? And I'm going to take this even further. There is a time for really important standards and being rigid about following them, and a time to amplify your self-expression. And I'm going to give you a tool in just a minute for how you can really use this. In fact, no, I'm going to give you the tool now because I think it'll make more sense. Think about a seesaw, you know, that teeter-totter thing. It's a balance. And so in certain environments, like maybe when you go home, home still feels like the same operating procedures as when you were eight years old. And so maybe you've been really putting more weight on the side of the way things have always been. And you've really not been giving a shit about your self-expression. The opportunity here is to see where in your life you have stopped being you. You have started giving a shit about things that don't align with your value, that suffocate you, that make you feel like you can't be you. That is not a place that you should be. Those are not relationships you should be in. But you got to think about this kind of like a seesaw. Where in your life are things out of balance and you're starting to give a shit and put it weight into things that no longer align with you? And where can you bring things more into balance so that you can be yourself, you can be self-expressed, and you can do so without offending people around you, without uh, you uh, violating corporate HR policies? So we were talking a lot about open-toed shoes. And... If I were walking into J.P. Morgan to close a massive, uh, you know, e-learning, you know, corporate training deal, I probably would not have worn my Valentino espadrilles despite how much they cost. I probably would have worn something else or at least I would have gotten a fucking manicure, okay? Why? Because there is a time and a place to be cavalier. Your job is a place to pay attention to standards. Why? Because they're paying you to do something. A job, I hope it's fun. I hope you're part of a culture and you have a sense of belonging and you feel appreciated. But the bottom line is you're there because you're getting paid to do something, which means you should care more about the standards and the culture and the operating procedures than you might in your day-to-day -day life. Why? Because you are making an exchange for money. But I have one giant caveat when it comes to talking about standards in the workplace, and I want to take this opportunity to have a conversation with you about it because it is incredibly important. It is very real. It's very real in work. It's very real in life in general, and it impacts people's ability to be fully, authentically their truest selves. See, there are a lot of standards, especially in the workplace, where discrimination and bias is very real, and it impacts people's ability to be themselves. And as a white woman, I have the privilege of never having to deal with that. I'll give you an example. So I have a bunch of black female friends who do not feel comfortable wearing their natural hair at work. And it's not just anecdotal. There is incredible research documenting this. So a recent study from Michigan State, for example, confirms that 80% of black women feel that they need to switch their hairstyle in order to align with more conservative work standards. And a recent study from Duke has proven that black women with natural hairstyles, like an afro or twists or braids, less likely to land a job interview than a white woman like me or a black woman with straightened hair. I mean, that just makes me want to cry. And here I am talking about open-toed shoes and black women have to worry about their hair and being who they are. That is so shitty. And that's why I wanted to take an opportunity and why I think it's so important to call out this type of bias. 
And that's why I'm doing it right now. So I want to acknowledge that whether it's your gender identity or your religion or your race or your sexual orientation or a disability that you have, I want to acknowledge that how you manage this balance that I'm talking about between self-expression and being your authentic, full self and the very real bias and discrimination that exist in social and workplace norms, that is a deeply personal decision and balancing act that you got to make every single day. And it's easy for me to say, hey, hiding who you are is never okay. Because it's true. I don't want you to ever hide who you are. But I just felt it was important that I acknowledge that it's easy to say, but it's not that easy to do. So let me kind of layer that into this rule number three that we're talking about, which is there's a time and a place for self-expression. It is up to you to decide what you value most in any situation. When you think about that seesaw between standards and societal or workplace norms versus your self-expression and you being you. But here's what I do know. I hope that you find the courage to choose your values and to choose being yourself as often as you can. And that brings me to the fourth rule. The fourth rule for how to learn how to give a shit about what matters and not care about what doesn't. The fourth rule is you go first. You go first. Every single human being that you encounter is trapped in some sort of rule they think they should be following. Everybody. And the rule, if you want to start giving a shit about what really matters, is you go first. You be the one that shows up with estrogels. You be the one that says, I'll pull on that space suit and climb into that thing. You be the one that brings the fun. And what I've found over and over and over again, and I think, Christine, you'll, you'll be able to say, yep, it's true, is that by being willing to put the real me, especially the hideous me, the moments where I'm crying, the moments where my makeup is running, the moments where the dog has just barfed all over something, the moments where I've just left a gym class where I've pulled a calf muscle and I'm still panting and my eyes are bloodshot and my face is beet red and I literally look at myself in the selfie and I say, how does Christopher Robbins wake up next to this every <laughs> single morning with a smile on his face? Because you woman are ugly. And then I hit play. My willingness to do that, my willingness to go first, to drop the mask, the filter, to just put it out there, it's liberating for people. I mean, people come up to me more often when I look like shit and I say, yeah, I'm happy to take a selfie. They're like, really? Like shocked that I would want to <laughs> actually take a selfie looking like that. And then somebody perfectly made up like, well, let me fix my hair. And I'm like, are you kidding? Look at me. I look like a labradoodle that just ran a marathon. I mean, give me a break. Get the selfie up here. Let's go. I'm going to make a kissy face because my jaw <laughs> is frozen and it makes it look like I'm taking a shit when I try to smile. Um, but what do you see, Christine? And the you go first. And the you go first. Yeah, absolutely. I mean, I think it's something that really connects with people uh, when they meet you of just feeling like they're running into a friend that they, you know, had seen from afar. And I think that there's something very special about that. And it's a true connection. And then something I would just add as somebody who's known you for a long time, gosh, 18 years at this point, um, wow. of you have always been exactly the same person. And so it's weird that when we run into people and people are super excited to see you just because I've known you for so long, but that it's a, it's a sincere connection for sure. And the other thing I would say is that I've never known you to make a negative comment about any one else's appearance, how anyone else is dressed. Like you're not, you know, I don't think that's something that you process or are connected to. And I think it's because you freed yourself of those mm. constraints that it's, I don't even know that it's something that you notice. And I think that's quite admirable. And I think that's also something to share of like, once you stop caring about those things, you'll stop paying attention to them and other people too. And it makes it better for everyone. That's a huge profound point because I've heard other people, Christine, make this point where they go, 
you know, when other people judge you, it's about them. It's not about you. But I think you just illustrated why. Because I don't ever critically judge what anybody else looks like or what they're wearing because you're right. I don't judge myself for what I'm wearing. I mean, I can laugh at myself. I sure. have humanity and humor about it, but I'm not actually very critical of myself. And I think if you can eradicate that in yourself, it's true. You don't actually criticize other people. It does begin with how you treat yourself. And it goes, and this also then reinforces what I'm saying about empathy. All those people that you're trying to, to, to be friends with that are competitive or they're like the, the high-end group or they're the fancy people and you feel that criticism, they're deeply critical of themselves. And that's the circle that you're chasing. Like you got to get right with you. And it's, a, it's an interesting topic how to not give a shit about, you know, stuff. Because it sounds like a throwaway co topic, but I think at the core of a great life, it's really one of the most important skills that you can, you can actually learn. Because what you're doing is you're really giving a shit about your values. And you're putting your attention and your mindset and your effort toward what you value. And you're spending less and less time and energy on things that you don't. I love that famous Nipsey Hussle quote. If you look at the people in your circle and you don't get inspired, then you don't have a circle, you have a cage. And I'm going to I'm going to add to that quote. If you look at the people in your circle and you can't be yourself, then you don't have a circle. You are in a cage. And you got to be very careful about this because here's what I've realized over and over and over again in my own life. It's that my own behavior and my insecurities are almost always what put me and keep me in that cage. And that brings me to a final story I want to share with you from last week. It's a story about our daughter, Kendall, and how insecurities can put you in a cage. If you follow me on social media, you're probably aware that our daughter graduated from USC last week, and she was given the honor of singing the national anthem at the 140th commencement ceremonies for the University of Southern California. So we were there. It was an unbelievable moment to watch our daughter sing the national anthem a cappella in front of 20,000 fellow graduates and their families. So we're talking at least 50,000 people there as she was singing. And one of the coolest things is as she was singing the national anthem and as the song starts to build, you hear the crowd getting louder and louder. And you can also hear her just coming into the fullest, most authentic version of who she is. Just take a listen to this moment. Oh, say can you see by the dawn's early light, what so proudly we hailed at the twilight's last gleam, whose broad stripes and bright stars through the perilous fight and the ramparts we were so gallantly strewn and the rocket's red glare the bombs bursting in air gave proof through the night that our flag was still there oh say does that star Bend 
Oh, that moment will probably be one of those moments that flashes before my eyes on my deathbed, like a core memory. But that's not the point of the story. The point of the story is this. 24 hours after that moment, I asked her, so Ken, what was the most surprising thing that's happened since you sang the national anthem yesterday? And she said this, I didn't realize that 99% of my friends have never heard me sing. I'm like, what? She said, yeah. She said, hearing me sing at graduation was the first time in four years of knowing me that they had ever heard my voice. Now, keep in mind, she is a popular music major. For four years, she has been performing in college. And just stop and consider that 99% of her friends over the past four years have never heard her sing. Why? Because of her insecurities. See, she gave a shit about what people would think about her singing. And if you look at her social media, for the last four years, there was only one post on her Instagram account. And that one post was of her singing. But that's it. Now, this is her deepest passion. Her standing before people and singing and sharing herself, this is the truest form of her self-expression. And yet, she put herself in a cage because of her insecurities. That's so sad. And I know you're doing it too. That in some area of your life, you are so concerned about what other people might think that you're not sharing your full self. That's what it means to put yourself in a cage. Now, here's the good news. The door to that cage, it's wide open. And it always has been. I hope this episode has inspired you to open your wings and express yourself, your full self. Because when you drop those insecurities and you stop caring so much about it and you allow yourself to just be you, you, my friend, will set yourself free. And in case no one else tells you today, I wanted to be sure to tell you. We are going to talk about the three things that you need to accept about other people. These are things I need to accept too. These are not easy things to accept, but trust me, when you accept these truths, the three truths about other people, it's going to make your life easier. And I'm excited to talk to you about this topic because it's very clear based on the number of questions that you have submitted at melrobbins.com about other people. Mel, how do I get my spouse to change? Mel, how do I get my kid to change? Mel, how do I inspire my team? Mel, what do I do about this person over there and that person over here? Or there's a different version of this question you've been asking too, which is, as I'm changing, why are my family not that supportive? Why is it that as I make big changes in my life, like I'm not getting the support that I deserve? Why is uh, the people around me not joining in on all these positive changes uh, I'm making that are inspired by this Mel Robbins podcast thing? Well, I'll tell you what, we're going to handle that today because it's clear that you need more advice, you need more inspiration, and you need more Mel Robbins on this topic about how to deal with other people. And there's something else. I need more of something. I need more of you. And so what you're going to hear today is you're going to hear listeners of the Mel Robbins podcast asking questions on this topic. And we are going to jump in and unpack these three truths that you got to accept, I got to accept about other people. Now, before I tell you the three truths, I just want to say one other thing. I have been absolutely floored by your response to this show. And I want to thank you. I want to thank you for spending your time with me, and I also want to thank you for sharing this with the people in your life. I was in California uh, the other day, and I was ordering a sandwich at a deli, and this woman who made my sandwich, as she handed me over, you know, the little sandwich wrapped in the white after they put the little sticker on it, she leans forward and she says, I didn't want to say anything, but I've been listening to your podcast my sister shared an episode with me, and I just want to tell you something. 
I immigrated here as a little girl from Africa, and I feel like what I'm learning on this podcast, she was whispering. I don't know if she didn't want her colleagues to hear or her boss. Like, I didn't know why she was whispering, but she's whispering. And she had these big glasses on just like me. And she said, but I feel like what I'm learning on this podcast, it's helping me sprout wings so I can fly and reach heights that I've always dreamt of. And I want to tell you, that is a shared success. You are helping me do that. Together, we are creating a positive ripple effect around the world. Together, we are inspiring people to dream bigger, to face obstacles and challenges, and most importantly, to feel a little less alone. And so I just want to thank you. I want to thank you for your time. I want to thank you for sharing these episodes with your friends, with your family. I want to thank you for posting it on social media because you just never know how sharing this stuff is going to change somebody's life. And I'm telling you right now, you are part of a force for good in this world that is empowering other people. And that's why I want you to know the three things that you have to accept about other people. Okay, and let me tell them to you right now, and then as we go through the questions, I am going to unpack these at a deeper level and, and explain to you that these truths, they're there no matter what issue you are dealing with when it comes to other people. So truth number one, if they wanted to, they would. Truth number two, you can't make somebody else change. You can make them dinner, you can make them laugh, but you cannot make someone else change. And number three, stop being mad that people aren't who you want them to be. Those are the three truths. They are hard to accept, but when you do, they make your life easier. And as we go through these questions one by one, and I not only give you more inspiration, more advice, more research about the specific issues in each question, I'm going to come back to these three truths over and over and over again and show you how accepting these three truths and applying them to all your relationships, it actually makes your life easier. And it's also easier on other people because what you're going to find out is because they apply not only to other people, but they also apply to you and me. So let's just take rule number one. If they wanted to, they would. Now, that kind of stings when you think about other people. When you think about folks in your life that, boy, I wish they'd make an effort. I wish they'd show up. I wish they'd reach out. I wish they'd try a little bit harder. I wish they'd get healthier. I wish they'd, yeah, if they wanted to, they would. But guess what? It also applies to you. There are people in your life that wish you would make an effort, that wish you would change some aspect about you. And the truth about all of us is we do the things we feel like doing. And when it matters to you, you do it. And it is hard to accept the fact that if you want to know where somebody stands on an issue, watch their actions. That tells you exactly what they want to do and what they don't want to do. Do not listen to their words because it's easy to say, yes, no, I do this, I'll do that, to talk the talk, but talk is cheap. And so it is hard to accept that if they wanted to, they would. And the truth about you is if you wanted to, you would. And so I wanted to kind of like say this swings both ways. Everything that we're going to talk about is true about other people, and it's also true about you. And I like reminding both of us that because it gives you a level of humility and a little bit more compassion when you get into situations with people where they're not doing what you want them to do. That brings me to our first question from Lisa. Hi, Mel. My name is Lisa. And I have a question for you. Mel, I am currently struggling with being a more tolerant person. I struggle with accepting others and their bullshit. We all have bullshit and we all have to carry it, deal with it and unload it. Don't get me wrong. I have worked on myself for years trying to be better and do better. But damn, I want to scream sometimes. Just be better. I have had to deal with so much in life. But I've always wanted more for myself and my family, regardless of the shit that life serves up. Meeting people where they are in life is so important. 
I know and understand this, but my patience is tried when people wallow. Any advice, Mel? Okay, I love this question, and I'm sure you can relate to it as much as I can relate to it. And before I dig into this, I want to divide Lisa's questions into two different topics, okay? So the first topic is her frustration that people don't want to do better. That's topic number one. Topic number two is how to deal with what's really irritating, which is people who wallow was her word. I say marinate, commiserate, just absolutely at some level love their bullshit. You know those people. Something's always wrong. They're always complaining. The weather's always bad or they're always unhealthy. They're like, like, you know, that kind of person. So let's start with the first part of that, which is this frustration that you hear in Lisa's voice. I just want them to do better. I've done better. There's almost like an arrogance and a judgment in that, right? That, oh, well, if I have fixed myself, you should fix yourself. If I can do this, then you should do this. And to me, that's toxic positivity. Just assuming that because you've done it, that somebody else should. And I'm emphasizing the word should, because should holds judgment. If you have the perspective that if I've done it, then you could do it too, that's inspiration. That's helping somebody. And so what you want to make sure that you're doing is that if you're frustrated, that you're coming from a place of love and coming from a place of wanting to help somebody rather than coming from a place of judgment of the should of the, you know, you're not doing this, you're not doing that, because we've all been on the receiving end of that, right? Where somebody's beaten you down because they've done something and they think you should do something. I can give you a really good example of this because I think there's a big difference of somebody being capable of doing something and somebody not being capable yet. As, as a person that is new to personal development, and I'm talking about myself, I've only known about personal development for just over 10 years. I am new to therapy. I mean, I've been engaged in therapy for a long time, but I feel like it takes a while to understand that there are certain things that a lot of people have never even thought about or been taught. I mean, I didn't bump into a lot of the topics that I'm talking about right now until I was in my mid-40s. For example, I'll give you one. I didn't truly understand trauma. When I heard the word trauma, I thought that that was something that that people that that served in the military had. I thought that you had to be on a tour of duty and see absolutely something horrific or be somewhere where there's extreme violence or be the victim of a really violent crime. I did not realize that there's big T trauma and there's little t trauma. I didn't realize that growing up in a household where you experience emotional abuse or you have parents that are distant or mismatched or maybe you experienced a childhood where there was a lot of poverty or there was discrimination. These are all forms of trauma. I had no idea. And so there are people in your life that would love to change, but they can't right now because they don't even understand that they are trapped in some kind of a trauma pattern. They're not aware of it. There are people in your life that would love to have the level of fitness that you have. I'd love to have the level of discipline that you have, but they're not capable of it right now because they maybe are struggling with depression or maybe they don't have the family structure around them that is supportive that you have, or maybe they didn't have the experiences that you've had in your life that have allowed you to develop the habits that you've had. And so I think it's really important when you start to feel yourself frustrated with other people to check your ego and to ask yourself, well, am I in the lane of wanting someone to better themselves because I care about them and I see potential in them? Or am I in the other side of this, which is I'm being really judgy. That's where my frustration is coming from. And I'm assuming that somebody's got the resources and the ability and the support and the knowledge 
and all of the, uh, I don't know, like motivation that you need in order to get started. And so I think it's super important, step one, that when you feel that frustration, when you feel yourself getting hooked, that you check yourself at the door. Do I want them to do this because I care about them or am I judging them and I think that they should do this because I think that what they're, bop, 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 when you get into that lane and you know it, you've got to take a breath. You got to recognize that you're coming from superiority. And I want you to step to the other side because understanding is an act of love. Being compassionate is an act of love. Being tolerant of where somebody is, is an act of love. I'm going to give you an example from my own life. So just this morning, Chris yelled at me. <laughs> That's my husband. And I'm kind of embarrassed to admit what happened to you. Because boy, oh boy, um, I will tell you, if Chris heard Lisa's question, he would say, I'm struggling with being more tolerant of my wife, Mel. And so here's what happened. Our new puppy, Homie, is going to go to a puppy class. And in order to go to this puppy training class on Wednesday, he needs to be up to date on his vaccines, right? No problem. Because when we got our puppy, when he was nine weeks old, I took him to the vet. He got all of his shots at week 12. And that was great. I'm a responsible pet owner. This is fantastic. Then all of a sudden the podcast launched and I've been gone. So Chris looks at me this morning and says, why didn't you tell me that homie is not up to date with his vaccines? I'm like, what are you talking about? I took him when we first got him. He said, Mel, that was when he was 12 weeks old. He's almost 20 weeks old, Mel. He's missed two veterinarian appointments. He is eight weeks late on getting his vaccinations. <laughs> I, I'm laughing because I feel so bad. And I said, well, I, I, and he, he, he's like, didn't you make follow-up appointments? I said, yes, yes. Where's his folder, you know, that, that, that came with him when we got him as a puppy. I, I, I borrowed a Sharpie from the vet when I was checking out and I wrote the dates in there. And sure enough, we got the folder out, and there were the two dates. We have missed both of those appointments. I never put them in the calendar. Chris took the folder. And this is a man who never gets upset. He took that folder, you guys. He slammed it shut. He slammed it against his desk. He stood up. He didn't even wheel around on his chair. He stood up. The chair rolled away. And he said, Mel, don't give me this ADHD shit. I know you have a lot going on, but you have a living and breathing animal that you are supposed to be taking care of. This is not acceptable. You have to do better. And there's the dog barking on cue. Apparently, he agrees. <laughs> I can't make this up. Everybody hates me right now. Yeah, and you know, and here's the thing, like I'm I know that Chris wanted to scream. Chris did scream at me. Just be better. And I know that I'm now gonna get flooded with comments and emails about this. I'm okay with that. I know I'm gonna get a lot of advice about ADHD. I know I'm gonna get advice about supplements now that you're hearing this story. I'm gonna get a lot of you that think I'm a terrible pet owner. I'm cool with that. This is what actually happened this morning. And here's what I had to say to Chris. I want to do better. I don't think I can right now. I am so busy at work. I do not have an assistant. I am terrible with the calendars. I'm actually impressed that I wrote the dates down that they gave to me. I thought I put them in the calendar, Chris. But my brain is dropping balls left and right. And so... The reason why I'm telling you this story is I'm not letting myself off the hook. I am motivated to try to figure out how to improve the systems that I have and improve the level of support that I have because I don't want to be dropping these balls. Chris doesn't need to get frustrated at me for me to feel like shit about this. Of course I want to do better. But this is one of those instances where my brain doesn't work like his. 
I can't just, like Chris is Mr. Foundational Operations Guy. Chris methodically sits and organizes and can sit still. He's really good with tech and with Excel spreadsheets. I am the opposite. I am absolutely the opposite. And so the reason why I'm telling you this story is because I guarantee you, you have somebody in your life that, my gosh, you just want to bang your head against the wall. And you can tell yourself if they wanted to, they would. And that's true for some things. It is true. It's true for whether or not people want to show up at an event. It's true for whether or not people reach out to you. It's true for whether or not people make an effort. It's true for whether or not people are engaging in healthy habits. If they wanted to, they would. And then there are some times that it's really important in your life in order to manage your own frustration to be a little bit more empathetic that if they could, they would. And I'll tell you, I am motivated to get the support that I need so that I do not drop balls like this because I want to do better. And having Chris yell at me, it was actually kind of helpful this morning because it, it just allowed him to be frustrated. It allowed me to see that this really is a big deal because he keeps picking up the slack on my behalf. And that's not a great solution either. And so here's kind of where the takeaway is on that. At the end of the day, it's about managing your energy. And when you allow somebody else's consistent behavior, I'm not talking about stuff where people are breaking the laws or they're addicted to something or, you know, something that's super, super destructive. But I've been married to Chris for 26 years and I've been this forgetful. I've been this forgetful and this bad the entire time we have been together. This is not new Mel Robbins. I am definitely overwhelmed with the launch of this podcast and the move to Vermont and all the travel recently and not having an assistant right now. But this is standard. I have wanted to change this my whole life. And I'm trying, man. And a little bit of empathy and support goes a long way. Because if you don't give that to the people in your life, if you're not more tolerant of the things that they're not capable of, they're just going to feel demoralized and ashamed. And so, yes, if they wanted to, they would. And make sure that if it's a situation where they can't really, or it's really hard for them, that you bring a little bit more empathy because that's going to help them. The other thing is, let's go to number two. You can't make someone else change. So I think this is super important because if you get as frustrated as Lisa's getting, ah, you can feel that. Chris is, ah. You can't make someone change. You just can't do it. Yes, you can make them dinner. You can make somebody laugh. You can make requests. You cannot make someone change. And so I'm going to tackle this in two ways. Do you know that Chris and I have come back to this issue of Mel's forgetfulness over and over and over and over again? And I'd say about 15 years ago, we made a decision because I am terrible with logistics and I am notorious at dropping balls and I am the queen of good intention. I am the queen of good intentions and I often lack the follow through. And I'm talking simple stuff. Like literally, here's another example. Um, we are going to a holiday party. I think it's on the 17th of the month. And uh, a friend of mine texted me and said, are you guys going to this party? I said, yes. She said, great. We're going to have people over for cocktails first. I said, great. Given that Chris and I had just fought about the dropping of the ball of the veterinarian appointment, I immediately screenshotted her text and sent it to my husband, Chris, and said, honey, I don't want to forget to write this in the calendar. So I'm telling you, so that you can make sure that we know and remember to go to this. That is what our system has been forever. So what's interesting is that you've got two choices when it comes to somebody and their behavior. Rule, the rule you need to remember is you can't make them change, which means you either have to stop trying to make them change or you need to figure out how to show up differently to make up for what they're doing wrong or to support them in an entirely new way. And so we already had a solution for the fact that this is an issue that I cannot change. 
And the solution is Chris is the point person for all things. If you want us to show up, go to Chris. If you need a check written, go to Chris. If you need to make sure that it's in the calendar, go to Chris. If the kids need a, uh, a whatever it's called, like a, you know how kids always have that, that exam that they need before they go to sports? What's that called? Like the, the annual wellness check? Thank you. You know how kids need an annual wellness check? Guess when Mel Robbins realizes they do? The day it's due. That's right. So if you do not want to have that kind of emergency, go to Chris. But what you have to accept in your life is that you're not going to make someone else change. I'm super motivated to be better, but Chris can't make me do it. I have to be the one to do it. And so you know what you're doing when you put energy into being frustrated about other people who either won't or can't make that change you want them to make? You're just burning energy. Imagine if you took all that energy that you're frustrated at other people and you just poured that energy in a positive direction to make your own life better. I often think about how many years of my life I have wasted being frustrated with other people. Truly. Wishing they would change, wanting them to change, trying to make them change. I've tried manipulating people. I've tried bribing people. I've tried, like, I'm talking with like a box of Legos or something. I've tried motivating people. I've tried inspiring people. The fact of the matter is, you can do all those things. But if somebody doesn't want to, they won't. If somebody can't, then they won't. So yes, make them dinner. Yes, make them laugh. Yes, try to be compassionate and understanding. But all of that energy and frustration that you can hear in Lisa, I want to scream sometimes. I'm sure you do because you're trying to make them change. That's why you're frustrated. And that brings me to the third rule. You got to stop being mad at people for not being who you want them to be. I will never be a accountant I will never be somebody who is OCD detail oriented. That's not me. My genius is in being creative. It's in connecting with people. It's, you know, flying by the seat of my pants. That's my genius. And somehow Chris and I have made it work for 26 years. And I think it has to do with the fact that we are 99% compassionate, understanding, and supportive of one another. And then there's those 1% moments that happened today over me being a dumbass about the new puppy. And of course, I feel terrible about it, but I will never be Susie Q with the calendar. That's just not who I'm supposed to be in life, and that's okay. But I can be more responsible about getting the support I need so I don't leave other people in breakdown. And we are going to get into boundaries because I know you're already going to, well, what do you do, Melvin? We will get there. But I want to address... One other aspect of Lisa's question, and it's this. Meeting people where they are in life is so important. I know and understand this, but my patience is tried when people wallow. Any advice, Mel? I'm going to give you a specific tactic for people who wallow. I call this the six-month rule. The people in your life get six months to wallow in anything. They have six months to wallow about the divorce. They have six months to wallow about the weight they've put on. They have six months to wallow about the job they lost or the circumstances or the weather or whatever else. And once the wallowing passes the six-month mark, you have a boundary to draw, okay? And this boundary works like a freaking charm because, number one, if they don't want to, they're not going to change. You're just going to wallow. Number two, you can't make them change. So don't even try. And number three, you got to stop being mad about this person not being a person that you want them to be. But you can draw a boundary. And you want to hear the boundary? It's the six-month rule. Here's what you say. So and so, I'll give you an example from my own life. So I have a um, friend that got a divorce after a really like, it was like, you know, one of those divorces is just ugly, just ugly, ugly, ugly. <clears throat> and the divorce was finalized. Okay. This friend of mine, every time I saw her constantly complaining about the ex and the, this and the, that, and the other thing and the other thing and the other thing. And finally, after six months, I looked at her and I said, you are no longer allowed to talk about this in front of me. I have recommended therapists. 
I have been a good friend. I have given you books to read, all of which you have done nothing about. I am no longer available to be a soundboard for your wallowing because it is clear to me that you don't want to do anything about this. The second that you would like to change this, I am here to support you. I am here to help you, but I am not available for you to stay stuck. I care about you too much. So if you'd like to go complain to somebody else, please do. But you are not allowed to bring this person's name up. You are not allowed to talk about your marriage, your ex-marriage, your ex, any of it. I'm not available for that anymore. And an interesting thing will happen. That person will be mortified. And they probably won't call you for a while because they're still addicted to their wallowing. You're not trying to change them. Isn't that interesting? You're not trying to change them. You didn't say stop wallowing. You said, I'm not available for it. So you know who changed in that relationship? You did. You changed what you're available for. Now, Chris could literally say to me, you're not allowed to take the animals to the vet unless I'm with you. You're not allowed to make travel plans. You're not allowed to respond to invites. He could say that to me and draw a boundary. He's not asking me to change. He's basically changing how he shows up with me, which is basically what he did about 15 years ago. And it solved most of the issues. So I want you to understand that when you understand and you accept these three truths about people, if they wanted to, they would, you know, unless they can't. Number two, you can't change anybody. And number three, stop being mad at people for not being who you want them to be. You take all the power back. None of this says you can't change. And so when you get frustrated by somebody else complaining, cut off access to the complaining. You're not saying I don't love you. You're actually saying the opposite. You're saying I love you so much that I'm not going to be a part of you staying stuck. And as long as I listen to this garbage come out of your mouth, you are going to be stuck. I'm not here for it. I'm here for your transformation. I am here for you creating a better life. I'm here for you moving on. I'm here for you no longer giving airtime to this asshole that you're divorced to. I am here for your future. I am no longer here for your past. When your friend is ready to change, guess what? They will because they will want to. Remember, that's rule number one. If they wanted to, they would. And, you know, one of the things that I want to say before we move on to question number two is that I think a lot of us learn that part of a relationship is struggle, that there's conflict, that there's tension, that you've got to have somebody to fight against or push against, that you saw these patterns growing up or they have been patterns in friendships or relationships. And so you're just kind of used to this push-pull. Well, what if I told you that it doesn't have to be that way? That maybe if you're in relationships that feel like a lot of work, that that's a sign that the relationships that you're in are no longer working for you. And one of the fastest ways to get rid of the struggle is drop the rope. Now, what does that mean? So think about tug of war. When you are playing a game of tug of war where you're on one side of the rope and, you know, you got other people on the other side of the rope and you're pulling back and forth and it's a lot of effort and pulling, yanking, yanking. You want to know the best way to win tug of war? Literally, as somebody goes to yank backwards, let go of the rope, they fall on their ass and then you yank the rope back towards you. Who said that's not fair? Of course that's fair. Letting go of the struggle often makes the struggle go away. And so notice that... Lisa's question was, Mel, I'm struggling to be a more tolerant person. And so the way you become more tolerant is accept those three things about people. If they wanted to, they would. If they could, they would. Number two, you can't make them change. Number three, stop being mad at them for not being who you want. And then you've learned some other things. Doesn't mean you can't change. Doesn't mean you can't draw boundaries. Doesn't mean you can't say, you can do all this stuff you want, but don't do it in front of me. I I have another example of that. I have a friend who is dating somebody and she adores him, absolutely adores him, and then confessed to me, but you know, when he goes out with his guy friends, they gamble and he does coke and I'm not down with it. I'm like, don't tell me, tell him. You're not going to change him, but you can tell him, I got a boundary. Don't you do that around me. That'll make somebody think because you're following the three rules You're not trying to change them, but you're very clear 
about what your values are and what's good for you. Not ask it. You didn't say don't do that. You said don't do it around me. Big difference. That makes somebody stop and think, doesn't it? It's going to make somebody question, well, what am I doing? If this person I really care about doesn't want it done around me, maybe I should start thinking about what I want done around me. I like it because it's sneakier and it's the truth and it works with these three rules. Anna is coming at other people's reactions from a slightly different angle. Hi, Mel. Um, my name's Anna. I just saw your stories and thought I'd send over um, a question that I've been having. Um, my question is is more about, well, I, I consider myself a very independent person and am definitely very disciplined in what I do, um, but that leads me to live a life that is very different from most of the people I surround myself with, I guess. Um, so my question is more of how to really hone in on that discipline and, and keep living the life that you know you should be living, even when others don't understand it or um, just don't get why you're, why you're doing it. Thanks. Anna, I love this question because you are making a mistake that every single one of us makes when we start to live a life that is truly aligned with what we want to be doing. Everybody that you are surrounded with right now has been on the road with you up until this point, but they have no idea what your day-to-day -day life is like moving forward because they're not living the same kind of life. And here's what I want you to understand. When this happens, and you start to make very deliberate changes, whether it's in your health, or maybe you've launched a business, or you are just tired of kind of a gossipy social climbing circle of friends, and now you're seeking deeper meaning in your life, you don't have to ditch those people. They can continue to be in your life, and they will be part of the rest of your life. But they're never going to understand what you're going through because they don't live the day-to-day -day life that you're living. And a major mistake that I see people making is as we're making major changes, we turn to our existing friends and our family for counsel. And they have absolutely no idea what we're going through. So for example, there are very few people on the planet who actually understand what I do for a living. I can count them on one hand. When it comes to speaking on corporate stages, hosting a podcast, creating content for people like Starbucks and LinkedIn and Audible, to being an entrepreneur, to having the social media following, to having uh, a marriage and a family, like very few people that understand the pressure I'm under, the impact that I'm making, the goals, the hopes, the dreams, the frustrations. My husband doesn't understand it. He's not in that world. My kids don't understand it. My friends don't understand it. If I want somebody to truly understand what my life looks like, I got to pick up the phone and call Jay Shetty or Jenna Kutcher or Trent Shelton, like somebody who is doing what I'm doing. And it goes for everything. Like I'm in the middle of menopause. I'm dealing, I talked on the last, uh, a couple episodes ago about this bread basket that I'm feeling on my waist and hormone stuff. I'm not going to go to a 28-year-old uh, fitness freak in my family and ask them for advice about my stomach. They don't understand what I'm going through. And so I'm, I'm making this point because when it comes to people-pleasing and when it comes to putting yourself first, the way that you continue to create discipline is twofold. You have to get super intentional about seeking out more people in your life either through mastermind groups or following people on social media or attending like online classes or going to different events, you've got to find people who are up to what you're up to because they'll understand. They'll support you. And you have to stop seeking validation from the people that are already around you because that's not why you're doing this thing. And here's one more thing I want to tell you. Why do you care what they think? You already said you're independent. You already said you're putting yourself first. Why on earth would you seek validation or advice from somebody whose lives you wouldn't, who you wouldn't trade lives with? 
just stop asking people who are miserable or unqualified to validate your happiness, your life, your choices. You got to validate yourself by making decisions that work for you. Stop looking for validation from other people, particularly other people who don't even understand themselves or what you're doing. Because if they can't understand themselves, if they don't understand what you're even trying to do, there's no way in hell they're ever going to understand or endorse what you're doing. Instead, start looking to people who have made the changes that you want to make, who have the values that you want to make. Not only do they understand what it takes to make this change, but they also have the confidence and the track record and the experience to cheer you on. Well, we've covered a lot of ground, and I think you're starting to realize, wow, this people-pleasing thing isn't really about saying no. It's about self-awareness. It's about my ability to catch those moments where those uncomfortable feelings rise up and to tolerate them. It's about my ability to know that there are going to be times in my life where I'm going to be making decisions that people that I deeply love are going to be disappointed by, and I can make space for both. There are going to be times in my life where I'm pursuing a change in my lifestyle that nobody around me understands, nobody else is pursuing, and I got to stop this default of seeking validation and advice from, from the people who don't understand what I'm doing. And when you learn how to do that and start making decisions that really empower you in the long run, your life is going to change. It's going to be more meaningful. It's going to be richer, deeper. You're going to feel more agency and control in your life. And I know what you're thinking right now. I know here's what you're thinking. Mel, dear God, do I want this. But if I'm the kind of person that has never, ever, ever put myself first, how the heck do I even know when to do it? And let me tell you something. First, you have to go back to the beginning and become self-aware. And you have to get deliberate about defining the person you are becoming. Let's hear this final question from a listener to this podcast named Nella. Hi, Mel. I am a big fan from Ireland. Um, my name is Nella. I'm a singer-songwriter and something that I definitely struggle with is with masking and, you know, being afraid to show up as my true authentic self um, to all people at all times. Yeah, just any advice would be amazing on how to just get better at doing that and have the confidence to just be my authentic true self um, all the time. <laughs> that would be great. Um, thank you. Nella, thank you first and foremost for your honesty. Um but I'm going to say something a little provocative. You kept saying the words true authentic self, authentic self, authentic self. And I want you to stop and ask yourself, do you even know who you are? Do you know what it means when you say, I am my true authentic self? And the reason why I'm asking you this question is because I don't think most people do. I think we want to be our... We want to be our authentic selves, of course. But what does that even mean? You know, listening to your question, it reminds me when I was writing The High Five Habit, there was a woman who wrote to me from Ireland and I ended up getting on the phone and then on a Zoom call and I spent a lot of time talking to her and she is in the book. And I want to bring this up because I want to make a point about the pressure that we feel to conform. So in this example of the woman from Ireland, she was writing about the fact that she wanted to get a divorce. That is her true authentic self. Yet she had been delaying doing this for seven years because of the pressure of the Catholic Church, because of the disappointment of her mother, because of what the priest might think, because of what the whole freaking country of Ireland might think. And so I'm highlighting this because for some of us, People-pleasing is even deeper than sort of this discomfort. It's the social norm. Like you wouldn't be caught dead in some cultures or in some religions or in some households veering from the norm. The pressure is so intense. It's just the air that you breathe. And for many people, that is the case. And so if that's you you might not even know what the authentic you is because you have been told for so long by your country, by your religion, by your family, by the community you live in, by whatever, who you're supposed to be. And I'm going to give you 
a really important exercise. I want you to just imagine that you are a screenwriter, that you are about to write a movie about the real you. Write a character description and describe a day in the life of the real you. Remove the country you live in, remove the religion you grew up with or you didn't, remove the stories that you've been telling yourself or the pressure you feel or the disappointment or what other people think you should or shouldn't do, and write the story, a day in the life, of who you are at your core, when you would wake up, where you would live, where you would go, what kind of work you do, what kind of friends that you have. What are your habits? What do you love doing? Who are you laughing with? This is such an important exercise because, again, remember, I told you that people-pleasing, it's a balance. And it begins with you truly knowing yourself. And if you don't really know who you are because you've always been told who to be and you've spent your life feeling like you do nothing but conforming, this is a really important step for you to take because... People pleasing at its core is you believing the person that you are deep inside that it's not good enough. You're not good enough. And based on what we've talked about, you can start to change that. But you really have to go through the steps of getting curious about who you are for real. And if the idea of you having a conversation like I did with my dad, or you telling somebody that you're not coming over for dinner because you're tired, and that's the truth. Or saying that, nope, you can't borrow my pickup truck again. I don't lend it out anymore. If that makes you really uncomfortable, here's a tool that you can use to start to experiment with that moment of discomfort. And the tool is called switch. And this comes from research. You don't have to say yes. You're going to go from saying, sure, I'll let you borrow my car. Or sure, we'll come to Thanksgiving. Or sure, I'll do that. Or yes, 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 yes. Instead of saying no, switch it to a pause. I'll think about it. Let me check my calendar. I'll get back to you on that. When you switch your yes to a pause and you buy yourself some time, you're going to feel a little less pressure. For example, when you say, let me get back to you. 20 minutes later, you can email back and say, thank you so much for the invitation. I'm booked. Or send no over text if it's too hard to say it in person. Or say no over the phone if you don't want to say it to their face. But switching from feeling the pressure to say yes to putting yourself in a pause, that's what I want you to practice. Because if you can say, I'll get back to you, let me think about it. You got time to settle those uncomfortable feelings. Because remember, it's not about the other person. It's about you not being able to tolerate that discomfort that rises up. And then you immediately make the discomfort going away by going, oh, okay, fine, I'll do it. No. Switch into pause. Switch into pause because in that pause, you're going to find some peace. In that pause is where you're going to find that balance. And I'm going to give you one more quick little example about how this works. So last week, I was in Las Vegas and we were on day 15 of a 16-day business trip. And we landed late and we did a tech check because I was delivering a speech in the morning and we were about to head up to the hotel. It was 8 o'clock at night. And I turned to my friends and I'm like, we should probably get something to eat because we haven't eaten since lunch. I know it's late and we're going to get up early and then I'm going to have to race and do the speech and then we're going to race and we're not have any food in our stomach. So we went straight to the steakhouse that was in the casino. We walk in there wearing sweats off an airplane. It is 830 at night. This place has a freaking DJ in the bar. People are thumping and bumping and glitters and sparkles everywhere. They seat us right away in the bar at a high top. The three of us order immediately because we are going to shovel down that food. I got the filet mignon and some mashed potatoes and we got mocktails. And right above our head was this speaker that was like boom, 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 boom. Like we were, I mean, it was like zero to a thousand inside this place. I was not ready for this. I just wanted to get some protein in my stomach and get to bed because I had a speech to give and I was exhausted. So we're eating and we're kind of bopping and talking. And right when the steak comes, I hand her my credit card signaling, bring me the check right away. I'm part of the clean play club. Like I am done. I have finished in probably 11 seconds flat. Uh, Melinda, who was at the table with us, she is done too. I look over at Amy. She 
she is eating in slow motion. She is enjoying every bite. I think she is engaged in a mindfulness meditation with this steak and salad at this point. And as I assess what is left on her plate, I think, this is going to fucking take her 20 minutes to eat. It is 930 at night. I am exhausted. This is the moment I'm talking about, everybody. This is the balance. Because the wave of discomfort comes up in my body. I want to leave. I want to go to bed. And I don't want to be a douche. I mean, here, one of my closest friends is sitting here enjoying a salad. We've been on the road together. I'm like a ride or die kind of person. What kind of a jerk leaves their female friend alone at a high top in a bar with a salad that has 85% to go in terms of completion just because they're tired? I do. (laughs) Uh, That's a joke. It's a balancing act. I said to myself, well, what's really going to serve me? And what's really going to serve me, because my number one job is to kill it in that speech tomorrow, is to ask Amy if it would be okay for me to go upstairs and just go to bed. And I felt that discomfort because the old Mel would have been like, I would have just sat there because it would be rude to leave somebody. And oftentimes we don't even ask. We don't even ask. And Amy's sitting right over there. So Amy, I want you to get on the mic because I, I rode the balancing act. I used the tools and I turned to her because a lot of this is also about the context and it's about how you say it. It's not what you're saying. It's how you say it. And so you don't have to be like, I'm leaving. Ugh, out of here, bitches. That's not what I said. I just said, Aim, would it be okay if I head upstairs and go to sleep? I'm exhausted. And Amy, what was your experience at this moment as I'm clean plating it and you've got probably 20 minutes left? Yeah. I mean, you're a fast eater. <laughs> so that was, that was number one. And I felt like, when you asked me and you said, you, you mind if I go upstairs? I felt like, thank God, because I would not want her to sit and watch me and my llama eating habits super slow and just savoring every bite. I wouldn't want that. I wouldn't want that to be the case. I want you to do you. And I want me to enjoy my salad and my so, steak. So when I, when you noticed that my plate was clean and so was Melinda's. Yeah. And you still had 20 minutes to go. What were you feeling? Well, I, I'm often in this situation. I felt like I know what's going to happen next. They're going to want to leave. And I'm, and I'm happy to do that. I felt, I felt really happy for you to get what you needed. And I needed to get what I needed. I wanted you to hear that. And this is why you often don't even ask. And Amy was relieved that I asked because you know what? She doesn't want to sit there and feel pressure. She wanted to enjoy her salad, and that's exactly what she did. Melinda and I went upstairs. She sat there for another 25 minutes, bopping and weaving, alone, having the best salad of her life without her annoying friends sitting there staring at her like she was some kind of a zoo animal. So we all won. Bottom line, people pleasing, it's not about the other people, it's about you. So notice when it comes up. Notice that discomfort. Find the strength to say no. I'm not going to sit here with this discomfort and do something that doesn't serve me. When you have the ability to recognize this and you have the ability to say, no, I'm not going to just fall into line. No means that you're in charge of your life. No strengthens your self-discipline. No keeps your goals and your happiness front and center. It can make you stronger so that you change patterns and habits that don't serve you. Because when you don't say no, you're saying yes to something else. It is powerful when you say no I am not going to do that. I'm going to ride this uncomfortable wave and I'm going to do what works for me. And I'm going to know at the end that you can be disappointed and you're still going to love me, but I'm going to love myself a little bit more because every time you say yes to you, you are proving to yourself that you deserve to be happy. You deserve to have support. You deserve to go to bed in Vegas because it's late and you deserve to have that room back because you need it. And you deserve to do things that really work for you. So starting today, start saying no. Start tolerating the discomfort. Switch your yes to a pause. And put yourself back in charge. Your happiness, your life, it starts with you. Always. Always, always, always. And I know you can do it. And I want you to do it. And you don't have to prove anything to me. You got to prove it to yourself. So today, when those 
uncomfortable emotions rise up and that balancing act, it is here. Do it. Do you. Today, we are talking about how you can protect yourself from other people's bad moods, how you deal with annoying coworkers, and boy, oh boy, do we have a juicy question at the end of this conversation today from Celeste about gossip. You are going to just love her question. And I'm so excited because, you know, we all have stories about dealing with people who are uh, like energy suckers, and I am bringing some stories today. But I want to make sure that you leave with some tools. And so I not only got some of the fun stories you're going to relate to from my own life, but I've got really visual metaphors and tools that are simple to remember. They're sticky. You can teach them to anybody. And so one, you're going to learn how to put up an energetic force field. Two, we're going to talk about strategies for how you protect yourself from other people's baloney. And three, I'm going to teach you how to keep yourself in a positive mood. Because that means no matter what's going on around you, you can be a force for good and you can protect your own energy, even when people are testing your patience or trying to suck your energy dry. So let's jump right in with a question from a listener named Veronica. Hi, Mel. It's Veronica. In the workplace, and I'm sure in other spaces too, I find that there are some people who, whether they are conscious of it or not, project their panic and anger in emails and communications, which more often than not turns my fine day into panic and anger as well. They are people who kind of bring the house down with them. How can you hear what they are saying and not be emotionally affected by it? Thank you. Veronica, that example of the emails, you know, like when you get a a text in all caps, or you get one of those emails where you can hear the edge in somebody's voice. And you're just like, why are you doing verbal diarrhea at me right now through this email? Because you would not speak to me this way. And I have this story. So I was in Los Angeles last week, and we were checking in at the front desk. And this woman comes like huffing and puffing from the elevators, okay? And she's she's doing that kind of walk where people are they're, they're like really hustling and shuffling on the floor and their elbows are really pointy, like they're trying to pump their arms to make them walk even faster and with more authority. And she had this high pony and it was swinging in the air and she had a really fancy like piece of luggage she was dragging and a duffel bag. And then there was this woman behind her kind of huffing and puffing behind her too. And they walk right up next to us at the front desk and she kind of slams her hands on the table as Chris and I are in the middle of talking to the woman who's checking us in. Now, keep in mind, the woman who's checking us in, it's probably 9.15 at night in Los Angeles. She looks like she's probably 24. And I assume, given that I have a 24-year-old daughter and I have a 22-year-old daughter, that she is probably a recent college grad who has majored in hospitality. And now she is in a two-year intern program where she is working in a hotel in a city she doesn't live in and she's got that kind of big blazer on that doesn't fit quite right and you can tell that she's exhausted and so I got this huffy puffy annoying woman next to me who is clearly entitled and she's angry what is she angry about oh well the doors to her balcony they don't close all the way. I didn't even know there were balconies on the rooms in this hotel. I mean, I'm not in that kind of room. So she starts like venting at this woman, venting at this 24-year-old woman in a hospitality internship program who does not have the authority to do anything, who is clearly exhausted, and who, by the way, is not responsible for the door to your balcony not working. And so why are you just vomiting on this poor gal. And you could see the life force just drain out of this woman who was standing at the front desk. And she apologized. She said she would get the manager who wasn't in and would be in in the morning. And then the woman huffed and she puffed. Well, what are you going to do about it now? I can't see anyone in and in and in. Like, I can't stand people like this. There is no reason not to be kind to other people. There is no reason not to ask for help in a polite 
manner. Because the people that you're asking for help from almost never are responsible for the thing that's not working. And the person that's emailing you at work, who's all frustrated because of the Q4 numbers and the boo 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 and the client this and the do 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 like you're not responsible for the stuff that's stressing them out. And so here's what I did in that moment because a couple things happened in that story. Number one, that woman's bitchy behavior and entitlement, it's like contagious. And when somebody's yelling at you, whether it's an email or you're separated by the front desk at the hotel that you're working at, it still like gets all over you. I think about the visual almost like if you've ever walked your dog and they jump into like muddy water or they roll in the mud or heaven forbid you're walking on the beach and there's a big nasty rotting fish on the beach and your dog runs right up to it before you can get to the dog and now your dog is rolling all in it and it's like ah! and then they run over to you and what does a wet dirty dog always do when that dog gets up to you they shake and when they shake all of that negative nasty muddy fish blah 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 blah, blah it just hits you and when somebody is in a positive or a nasty mood it's like a muddy dog shaking and that energy gets all over you. And so it's critical in these moments that you protect your energy. And for me, I normally speak up when I see this kind of thing because normally I have really great energy and I'm not going to let somebody get away with that. But the truth is I was really tired. I had just flown across country and we were in town to do something that was weighing on my mind, and I just didn't want to get into a fight with somebody who clearly had an ax to grind with absolutely anybody, and I'm not going to change this person anyway. And so what I do in those moments, when I start seeing that muddy dog shake or that high ponytail start flapping her mouth and, and being rude, is number one, I take a deep breath. That's it. I just take a deep breath. And there's a breath technique that you can use called 478. I don't remember who came up with this. I'm sure some will put it in the show notes. But you breathe in for four seconds. Hold it for seven. Then out for eight. And I read somewhere that the eight part is the most important. Because when you breathe out for longer than you breathed in, it sends a signal to your nervous system that it's okay to relax. And the four, seven, eight breathing technique will start the relaxation response in your body. And so if you get that all cap text from a friend or you get that really rude email from a colleague or you're standing somewhere in public and some jerk is annihilating the person and you just don't have the energy to go, hey, you know, you don't have to be rude about it. Do the four, seven, eight breathing technique to signal the relaxation response in your body to protect your energy. I have a second tactic that I love. Oh my gosh, I love this. <laughs> Here's the visual. I use this all the time. In fact, I just used this in a different situation last night. Um, I call it the snow globe. So have you ever had a snow globe as a kid? You know, it's that glass ball and in it, they, they, they have these typically around the holidays or if you go to like a museum or a gift store at a, at a theme park, they tend to sell them there. I don't know why, but it's this glass ball and in it is usually some sort of scene. So imagine uh, a holiday tree, some reindeer, something like that comes to mind. Or you could think about the, 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 the palace. What's that? Pa Cinderella's Palace at Disney. They probably have snow globes with Cinderella's Palace at Disney, right? What happens when you pick up a snow globe and you shake it? All of that crap in it starts flying around. You know what that crap is? It's like that wet dog mud. Think about a snow globe. The next time you are around anybody who gives you attitude. 
Because when you picture the person like the chick with the high ponytail, trapped in her own little snow globe, and there she is bitching and barking about something and spewing her negative energy everywhere. But if you think and picture her having her tantrum in a snow globe, let me out of here. And all of that sparkly stuff is what gets shaken up and all the negative energy. If you visualize her inside the snow globe, you can laugh at her and it doesn't get on you. So I use this even like a couple days ago, I was at a coffee shop and again at another airport and we were standing in line and we ordered coffee and they were super, super busy and it was taking a long time. And I looked at the watch. We had 20 minutes before the flight was going to leave. And Chris was getting testy with me because he's the kind of person, my husband, that we have the opposite travel languages. So I have my travel language is be the last person on the plane. Get to the gate as late as possible without missing the plane. Spend as little time in the airport as possible. Chris, on the other hand, he basically likes to stroll through an airport He likes to sit at the gate for a while and get comfortable and read his book and enjoy his coffee. He uh, loves getting there early. And so we have the exact opposite travel language. He has agreed to stand in this long line with me to get a cup of coffee. He's starting to get agitated, not quite snow globe uh, agitated, but you know, you can tell he's getting nervous and his coffee comes out. And so I say, why don't you take it and go and hold the plane for me? I'll be right there. So he leaves. And now it's taking a minute and another minute and another minute. And I start to realize, holy cow, I'm going to miss this plane. I start to realize, holy cow, I, I actually need to leave. And so I go to the counter and I say to the woman who's, they are really busy. I mean, you can tell she's stressed. And I'm not like the lady with the ponytail. I just lean forward and say, hey, you know, are, is the, the drink for Mel about to be done? Because otherwise I'm going to just have to, you know, say, give it to somebody. And she... Ah, like she had a tantrum. I'm, I'm doing the best by hand. She erupted. See, when somebody throws a tantrum, here's what I know. What I know is they're having trouble tolerating all the negative emotion that they're feeling. This woman behind the counter is feeling a ton of pressure. She's behind. She's frustrated. I'm sure other people have been rude to her. And my question to her, it was the straw that broke the camel's back. She just couldn't handle the negativity and the stress anymore in her body. And so she had a tantrum. She exploded at me. Whatever. She's allowed to have a tantrum. It's a stressful job. I get it. And because I can picture her inside her own little snow globe, having her own little tantrum, all the sparkly stuff flying all around her, that's her negative energy. It stays inside the snow globe. I said, no problem. Totally understand. And I left and went to my plane. And you know what? I didn't let it bother me. And that's the beauty of these strategies. See, there are always going to be people and situations in life that are triggering. The world is full of jerks and people who cannot tolerate their own emotional experience. And when you do the four, seven, eight breath to trigger a relaxation response inside yourself, you take control. When you visualize whomever it is, whether it's the colleague sitting behind their desk and they're stomping on their keyboard, having their own little tantrum in their little cubicle, inside their little snow globe, you protect yourself. And that way, these emotional vampires that are out there in the world and these emotional vampire-y type situations that drain you and your energy, they don't impact you. And this is so important because when you look at the research around human connection, our brains are programmed to connect with other human beings. That's how we're wired. It's part of our biology, our physiology. In fact, we seek out connection. We want meaningful bonds because when we do that, it not only feels good, but your brain releases oxytocin, which is a wonderful feel-good chemical in your brain. It rewards that kind of thing. And if we feel disconnected, we feel unsafe. And in fact, if we're around somebody else who's stressful or weird or hostile, like the chick with the ponytail, do you know what happens? Your brain releases yet another chemical. This one's called cortisol. And cortisol is the stress hormone. And so you immediately not only sense 
that something's off with this person, but you also have this chemical physiological response. I think that's why we often, you know, label people's behavior as toxic or icky or gross because it feels that way to you, just like a dog that is shaking and gets their mud all over you. And I think we know common sense wise that people's moods and energy are contagious, but there's a new study by scientists at Oxford and Birmingham universities that show that bad moods, they're not only contagious, they're more infectious than good moods. And on top of all of this, your brain has something called mirror neurons. Mirror neurons are amazing because what they do is in nanoseconds, they can process and register any human being's facial expression, body language, tone of voice. It's absolutely unbelievable. And what ends up happening is your mirror neurons make you start to mirror the same emotions as the people around you. This is why when you're watching a movie, and that sort of sappy music comes on or somebody in the movie starts to cry, your mirror neurons are what are triggering you to start welling up too. And they also work for the positive. If you look at somebody eye to eye and you hold eye contact and you flash a huge toothy smile, it takes less than five seconds for the mirror neurons and the person who you are looking at and smiling at to kick in and that person will not be able to help themselves but smile back. And this is important for you to know because it works both for the good, you can catch really good energy, and when it comes to bad energy, that's easier to catch. Hey, it's Mel, thank you so much for being here. If you enjoyed that video, by God, please subscribe because I don't want you to miss a thing. Thank you so much for being here. We've got so much amazing stuff coming. Thank you so much for sending this stuff to your friends and your family. I love you. We create these videos for you. So make sure you subscribe. Mwah.